was an amazing woman named Anna Dupree who has her own significance in Houston history and in black history in Houston because she was a successful beauty shop operator at a time when beauty shops were segregated. She married a man named Claude Dupree and they were very successful entrepreneurs even during the depression era of the 1930s. And they built the El Dorado building and opened it I believe in 1939 and the downstairs was gonna be dedicated to separate business spaces, but that big second floor was going to be the El Dorado Ballroom. The El Dorado was built so black people could see their artists with dignity. So there used to be this beautiful marquee sign at the top of the building that denoted that you were in the center and the heart of Third Ward. It's proximity and location to downtown. It's directly across the street from one of our most prime cultural jewels, Emancipation Park. It was a place where folks, African-American folks, would dress in their finery and go to hear music and to dance and to socialize. And a lot of prominent black social clubs held events there at a time when people of a certain skin tone weren't allowed to go to this place downtown or that place. They had their own place. This was the Savoy Ballroom and even more in our region of the country. It saw all sorts of premier Grammy award-winning acts. Ray Charles performed there. Duke Ellington performed there. Count Basie's played here. T-Bone Walker's played here. The great Conrad Johnson. In 1947 in Houston, he recorded a song called Howling on Dowling, back when Dowling Street was that drag that's now known as Emancipation Avenue. And in that song, he mentions the El Dorado. It represented achievement and status, both economically and socially among its patrons, but also among the musicians, people like I.H. Smalley, Ed Golden, Arnett Cobb, Milton Larkin. These are some of the band leaders that were there. The bands were typically wearing, you know, tuxes and stuff. It was a prestige venue. If these walls could talk, they would have so much to say. I mean, can you imagine being here when B.B. King was here or Jewel Brown, who's still with us? At the El Dorado, I was 12 years old when they called me. And I went there and used to do my show with a, a wonderful dance group called Tommy and Orr. They were some great guys. I never will forget it. Oh, and when I sang songs like C.C. Rock, oh my goodness, the, it's like the floors was just... <laughs> it was really something. And the windows back in the day, they pushed out from the bottom. And the nights my mother couldn't go, even though my daddy worked like he did, he would take me, but he'd sit in the car. While on the weekends and at night, it was an adult establishment set up to entertain. It also had a role in the community that makes it extra important. And that is often on Saturday afternoons, they would have sock hops for teenagers and or talent shows where kids that couldn't go in a nightclub could come on a Saturday afternoon and they'd spin records and could dance. There are countless musicians, many of them natives of Houston and some who came from out of town who first got their recognition by winning a talent show at the El Dorado. One would be a musician who is known by the stage name Peppermint Harris, but then hometown folks like Joe Guitar Hughes, Johnny Guitar Watson, people like that when they were children got to perform on that stage, won talent shows, that gave them the affirmation they perhaps could use to say, I've got a life in music. The El Dorado Ballroom it did change a few times over the years. There was a fire at one time and there was some reconstruction. At some point later on, they, they got air conditioning. The thing that hurt the El Dorado, apart from some general social change and change in musical taste was, at that time, they didn't have any parking places. And so you have this irony. As the community becomes more affluent and owns automobiles and more spread out and is no longer segregated into one place, that works against the interests of the old prominent place. Get to get and get to get and take the baby home and pet and put it to bed. I love this story because a Jewish man enjoyed the sounds of the El Dorado back in the day, but it was, it was Jim Crow segregation, so he wasn't allowed in the space. Mr. Finkelstein was his name. He would come over and listen to the music here. 
or he was sitting in the parking lot and listening to it. And he acquired the space along with the surrounding land. He didn't want it to be uh, torn down or redeveloped. So Mr. Finkelstein gifted the El Dorado to Project Earth Houses in 1999. And since that time, it's undergone various renovation projects. But this, to date, is our largest renovation and rehabilitation of the space ever. Project Girl Houses was founded in 1993 by seven visionary African-American artists who not only wanted to showcase their work in this neighborhood, but wanted to protect and preserve the rich history and culture of Third Ward. They were inspired by Dr. John Biggers at Texas Southern University Art Department. He founded that department. A lot of them studied under him. Once Project Row Houses acquired it, there were a series of events, particularly in those first few years. In November of 2003, that would have been the 100th anniversary of the birth of a noted Houstonian, Don Roby, who went on to found Duke and Peacock Records, which recorded Big Mama Thornton and Bobby Bland and Junior Parker and all kinds of famous people. We drew a lot from folks who were still alive in the region and in the community that could come in and help us understand what the El Dorado had been, what it could be. When the renovation project is complete, of course, it will be brought back up to code with this sound system that will be able to accommodate all types of performance artists, but it'll also be a gathering space. We don't want to lose that part of this space that people like to gather here for life milestones, but we just see this as another opportunity to, to offer some real holistic life amenities to improve the quality of life of our, our community and our neighbors. So many American cities look the same, but when you find something that's distinctive, that's rooted in that place historically, and it isn't just physically there, but that it's of that place. <laughs> you know, that's a different kind of thing. It can meet a need, a larger social need that goes way beyond music history, as a place where people can connect with each other, connect with the neighborhood, connect with the city, and connect with our history. This is a space that the community is deeply emotive of. They have such great reverence for this space and have celebrated so many great life milestones. And so we're so excited that we're able to be able to raise the resources to bring this great storied building back to what it once was. I feel all right. I feel all right. I feel all right.